If it's Wednesday, Donald Trump's triumph in New Hampshire sets up a likely and long rematch with President Biden as leaders in both parties gear up for a brutal general election, even as Nikki Haley vows to keep fighting. Plus, some wild developments tied to Arizona's Senate race as the state's Republican Party chair is now resigning, but claiming he was set up after audio surfaced of him offering Arizona Senate candidate Carrie Lake money in exchange for not running. And broiling tensions, the U.S. military launches retaliatory airstrikes against Iran-linked militias as Israeli officials throw cold water on talks of a temporary pause in the war against Hamas amid intensifying fighting in southern Gaza's main city. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Peter Alexander here in Washington. There is not much that Donald Trump and President Joe Biden agree on, but after last night's New Hampshire primary, both campaigns, their allies, their party apparatuses do agree that a Trump-Biden presidential rematch is all but inevitable. Both men have significant work, though, to do to shore up some major political liabilities. We start on the Republican side. Donald Trump, with that projected double-digit win in New Hampshire, has prompted the RNC, mainstream conservatives, even former Trump rivals, to urge Nikki Haley to get out and not to draw out what they see as a futile and bruising nomination fight that could fracture their party and weakens it, weaken its chances in November. So here is the chair of the Republican Party after last night's results. I'm looking at the math and the path going forward, and I don't see it for Nikki Haley. I think she's run a great campaign, but I do think there is a message that's coming out from the voters, which is very clear. We need to unite around our eventual nominee, which is going to be Donald Trump, and we need to make sure we beat Joe Biden. Despite that growing pressure and losses in the first two contests, Haley says that the only place that she is going is onto the next major primary contest, which is in her home state of South Carolina, and here she is on that last night. New Hampshire is first in the nation. It is not the last in the nation. This race is far from over. There are dozens of states left to go. And the next one is my sweet state of South Carolina. As former President Trump's allies are trying to get their candidate to focus on winning in November, Mr. Trump responded to Haley's remarks with an impulsive and falsehood-filled diatribe in his victory speech last night, lashing out, spreading lies about his election defeats, and calling political rivals, quote, evil. Here he is. Who the hell was the imposter that went up on the stage before and like claimed a victory. She did very poorly, actually. Just a little note to Nikki. She's not gonna win. She's not gonna win. But if she did, she would be under investigation by those people in 15 minutes. And I could tell you five reasons why already. Not big reasons. A little stuff that she doesn't want to talk about. I felt I should do this because I find in life you can't let people get away with bullshit. Okay? You can't. You just can't do that. And when I watched her in the fancy dress that probably wasn't so fancy come up, I said, what's she doing? We won. Those remarks came as Republican primary voters in New Hampshire were simultaneously signaling significant reservations about Mr. Trump's viability in November. We're going to have more on that in a moment. Meanwhile, on the Democratic side, after last night's successful, if symbolic, write-in campaign in New Hampshire, President Biden is wasting no time publicly predicting and preparing for a Trump rematch. And today, with a clear eye on November, he spoke to the United Auto Workers Union as it formally endorsed his campaign. NBC's Garrett Haig is following the Trump campaign. He is in New Hampshire. NBC's Ali Vitale is on to South Carolina with the Haley campaign. And NBC's Monica Alba is at her perch where Mr. Biden just wrapped up his remarks a short time ago. Garrett, we want to start with you. The campaign may want to be in full speed ahead in November, but Mr. Trump seemed to have his own plans preoccupied with Nikki Haley last night. So what, if anything, is the campaign doing to try to get him to direct his focus forward? 
Yeah, it's so interesting, Peter, when you compare the victory speeches from Iowa and New Hampshire, the Iowa victory speech was the one I think the campaign would have wanted him to give, focused on uniting the Republican Party, forward-looking, taking on Joe Biden. What we saw last night was anything but. It was this kind of grievance-filled focus on Nikki Haley, whom he just can't seem to put in his rearview mirror. And I think you saw a pretty good example of how the campaign and Donald Trump's allies are trying to keep him focused in what's one of the most talked about, most awkward exchanges of the night, in which he sort of channeled his thoughts on Nikki Haley through Tim Scott on stage. Watch this. Did you ever think that she actually appointed you, Tim? <laughs> and think of it, appointed, and you're the senator of his state, and she endorsed me. You must really hate her. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's a shame. It's a shame. Uh-oh. I just love you. No, that's that's why he's a great politician. Peter, having covered Tim Scott for a long time, I don't think he really hates anybody in politics, but that's Donald Trump. Everything is personal for him. And I think until they get Nikki Haley out of this race, the campaign, whoever's running it, whoever's, whatever ally has his ear, is going to have a very hard time keeping him forward looking at the general election uh, as we progress through this next month or so. And Garrett, as we've both learned, the campaign, the former White House would always say of Donald Trump that he is his own best messenger, but there were some prominent messages on That's the Republican right. side. Kaylee McEnany, his old press secretary, Ari Fleischer, a past White House Republican press secretary, basically saying he should have spent last night focusing on Joe Biden, not on Nikki Haley. So what is the campaign going to look like through South Carolina? I think it's going to be very bitter, Peter. I mean, I would take it even further. Look at somebody like John Cornyn coming out to endorse Donald Trump last night. Cornyn is nobody's idea of a Trump fan within the Republican Party. His endorsement is all about, let's focus on Joe Biden. Let's unite the party. I mean, the, the rest of the party is basically begging Donald Trump to stay focused on Joe Biden. But the Trump campaign's advisors tell me they only have one speed. It's attack, attack, attack the person in front of them. And as long as Nikki Haley's still in the race, she's going to bear the brunt of that, even as the campaign kind of split its focus between Joe Biden and the primary that they still can't quite put away, as daunting as the match may be for Nikki Haley. Garrett, we hope you get to put away that jacket pretty soon after a long stretch in Iowa and New Hampshire. Come on <laughs> home, my friend. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Ali Vitale in what, at least for the moment, is a bit warmer. South Carolina, where Nikki Haley last night, Ali said that the campaign is going to continue in her sweet home state, as she described it. Take us behind the scenes there if you can. Obviously, as we saw with Ron DeSantis, you're only in this thing until you're not. What is the feeling among her allies today? Is this for real? Is she going to be able to hold out till the South Carolina primary? Yeah, Peter, Nikki Haley said South Carolina's up next, and I said, say no more. I am getting here as soon as I possibly can, because for Nikki Haley, it's going to be time on the ground that really is allowing her to make the move she needs to, to do well here in her sweet home state, as she likes to call it. But you're right to point out that for all of these candidates, they want to stay in until they're unable to stay in anymore. And for Nikki Haley, the big question is going to be not how many campaign events can she string together, not how many times she can challenge Donald Trump on mental fitness or age or challenging him to debate her. But instead, it's going to be a question of are donors going to continue giving to her as she tries to present herself as the continued alternative to Donald Trump? I do think it's worth pointing out here. There are two ways of looking at this, and I've heard both from my sources. It truly just depends who you talk to. On the one hand, you're hearing from people like Ronna McDaniel, the RNC chairwoman, Donald Trump, people who have endorsed the former president saying, look, he's won by big margins in each of these states. It's time to move on and unite so they can move on to the general. The other school of thinking, of course, comes from Haley, her allies, people who don't want to see Trump as a continued standard bearer of this party. And they're saying Nikki Haley has not yet been able to give it a full binary go of it in terms of the fact that Ron DeSantis was still in the race in New Hampshire until, you know, two days before people went to the, pri to the primary polls. They think that by giving her this next month stretch and making it a true one on one, she'll be able to continue some upward momentum. That's something that the campaign often points to in my conversations with them. And right now, if you look at the way that they're doing this, they've just put millions of dollars on the air here in South Carolina in advertising. They're building out their team to try to fan out across not just this state, but also be able to play down the stretch in Super Tuesday states like Michigan yeah. and Virginia and Texas. 
all of those are part of their equation. It's just a question if at some point someone says, hey, I think we've hit the end of this road. Yeah, so Ali, what is the end game here, right? I mean, is, is there any world in which she ultimately gets behind Donald Trump? I guess the real question for her is, what does she see as her potential political future within the Republican Party? I know, and I think that's such an interesting question because we saw someone like Ron DeSantis make that calculation effectively in real time, dropping out and endorsing the former president, however tepid that endorsement was. For Nikki Haley, though, when I was watching her on stage last night, I know there was some back and forth among folks who were watching her give extended thanks at the top of her remarks. She had done that in Iowa, but I think given the stakes in New Hampshire, New Hampshire, people were wondering, is this going to be the end? Is it going to be a surprise dropout? Instead, she went even harder at the former president, and she's doing so on the airwaves here. Watch. Biden, too old. Trump, too much chaos. A rematch no one wants. There's a better choice for a better America. Nikki Haley will cut taxes, close the border, and defeat the Chinese communist threat. America's new chapter, strong and proud. To me, Peter, the upshot of ads like that, and especially the remarks she made last night, is you don't go after the former president, Donald Trump, by saying he has senior moments and then immediately turning around and dropping out. That makes no political sense, and it's why I think Nikki Haley, at least for now, is still in this thing. Allie, stay warm. We're glad to see you in South Carolina. Now let me get to Monica, who's been focused on <laughs> Joe Biden today, who had something of his own uh, in the way of a celebration with the UAW finally securing that long sought after uh, endorsement from the United Auto Workers today. Take us inside that room and, and what you're hearing about the Biden world as they are changing things behind closed doors is the way the campaign ramps up. Yeah, Peter, exactly. They are shifting some of the president's real brain trust here from the White House to the campaign. These are two top advisors in Jennifer O'Malley Dillon and Mike Donilon, who have been with the president for a long time, who officially were under the White House umbrella, but now are going to the campaign to play some key roles there. And they say that's really just a result of the acceleration with which former President Trump consolidated support in the Republican Party. Everything you've been talking about up until this point in the show. And so that's why they're making these moves, though it did come as a little bit of a surprise because originally this was something that was thought to have happened later down the line. But as we know, the general election here is pretty much in full force. And a good example of that is what happened here behind me today. And that is the United Auto Workers Union formally endorsing President Biden. Now, he loves to tout himself as the most pro-union president in history. He talked about that here today. He also reminded everybody that he was the first president ever to join a picket line and really visit those auto workers in uh, Michigan a couple of months ago who were seeking higher wages and cost of living increases. And that was very, very popular among the crowd here, of course, which you would expect. But there was also a moment here that is something we have seen recently in the last couple of weeks, which was a brief interruption. Take a listen to how that went here in the room. Any money that Congress gives the president to spend to build a product, whether it's an aircraft carrier, an automobile, a tank, or a staircase. No matter what that was, it should be built. So as you can see there, those were pro-Palestinian supporters who were expressing their frustration with the Biden administration's continued support of Israel in its war against Hamas. This is something we saw more than a dozen times yesterday when the president, the vice president, and their spouses were speaking about reproductive freedom in northern Virginia. It was something that the president there acknowledged as a coordinated effort. Today, the White House, the campaign have been clear. They say, look, we understand people are going to express their views. They are absolutely have a right to do that, and they're going to continue to do that. But it's a question for how the campaign continues to really respond to that as we head into this general election, and there's likely a lot more of that to come, Peter. Yeah, certainly uh, teeing up the potential for pretty long several months ahead for anybody going on the trail right now with so many of those pro-Palestinian protesters surprising the president as they have in recent days. Monica, thank you so much, and congratulations on being first to report the UAW endorsement. As we did first mention, despite former President Trump's back-to-back -back wins in Iowa and New Hampshire, there are some warning signs about the strength of his third run for the White House. NBC's Chuck Todd is at the big board with more. Chuck?
Look, if there's one big thing I took away, when you think about the swing states, New Hampshire is a swing state, but it may not be a state that Donald Trump can win. Let me show you a few reasons why. First, just look at the party ID. The beauty of the New Hampshire primary in general is that it is a way to test whether potential presidential nominees can appeal to the middle of the electorate. There's always a big chunk of independent voters that participate. Well, we see here, Donald Trump got trounced among independents. Nikki Haley got 58%. Look, most of these Haley voters are going to vote Republican in the general election, but not all of them. That's a, already a piece that you would end up putting into the Biden puzzle. All right, let me take you down to a couple of other little clues. How about if Donald Trump wins the nomination? Nearly 40 percent tell us that they would be dissatisfied with that outcome. Again, most Republicans, quote unquote, go, come home, right? And they'll, most of them will be for Trump, but not all of them. And New Hampshire isn't alone in seeing stuff like that. How about the issue of abortion? Again, these are middle-of-the-road voters in New Hampshire. It's a good test. Look at this. 67% of New Hampshire Republican primary voters oppose the idea of a federal law banning abortion. Now, this is a state where they have a Republican governor who is pro-abortion rights and Chris Sununu. So it doesn't mean these votes are automatically going to go over to Biden. But it's yet another piece of the swing voter puzzle here that is running against the grain for a Donald Trump nomination. And then, of course, there's the issue of fitness. If Donald Trump is convicted, we have the likelihood that he's convicted of something with 91 counts before Election Day is out there. So the no was 42 percent. And as you see there, uh, Haley got 83 percent of those voters. Now, Trump still gets some of the voters who don't think he's fit. But that isn't a big number. And a lot of these voters will at least take a, another look at somebody else on the ballot. Perhaps it ends up Biden or even somebody else, but it's yet another sign. So you put all of this together, right, and you see all these little, little pieces. And while Donald Trump looks like he is going to roll to this nomination, his general election vote has a lot of holes in it. Chuck Todd, appreciate your expertise. Thank you so much. And coming up right here, Scorched Earth or Unity campaign. I'm going to speak to Congressman Byron Donalds, a loyal Trump supporter, about the frontrunner's strategy against his political rivals in both parties. Plus, Trump versus Biden round two. What a likely rematch between two unpopular political leaders says about the state of American politics and the fight over U.S.'s democracy. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. After winning in Iowa last week, former President Donald Trump called for party unity, saying it was time for Americans, regardless of political affiliation, to come together. Last night, though, after defeating Nikki Haley in New Hampshire, he went on the attack, angrily denouncing her and his political rivals and urging her to drop out of the race. It all begs the question that which version of Trump will we see as he marches towards the nomination and looks ahead to November? And joining me now to help answer that question and others is Republican Congressman from Florida, Byron Donalds, a supporter of the former president. Congressman Donalds, I appreciate your being with us on Meet the Press now. Why is former President Trump and the Republican Party so concerned right now with Nikki Haley getting out of the race immediately? Uh, I don't think it's a matter of concern. I think it's just more a matter of the fact that everybody knows what's about to happen. Nikki Haley's going to lose in Nevada. She's going to lose in South Carolina. She's going to lose in North Carolina, in Florida on Super Tuesday. That's going to happen. If, if you look back at what happened uh, last night in New Hampshire, the vast majority of votes she received were from Democrats who were undeclared in the New Hampshire primary. That's not going to translate in the rest of this campaign. And so a lot of Republican voters including uh, party leadership and the president, are a little frustrated because we all know what's about to happen. There is no pathway. And the only pathway that really exists for her campaign right now is if the donors continue to fund it. But it's not going to happen at the ballot box. Well, let me ask you about those independents, then, if I can, really quickly. There have obviously been some warning signs for the former president, some of which we saw last night. you got moderate Republicans who have spoken out against Donald Trump, supported Nikki Haley. You have some independents who supported Nikki Haley as well. Here's what two registered Republicans told us. Take a listen. I think he, Mr. Trump's going to be too preoccupied with other things, unfortunately. So. Mm. And have you voted for President Trump in the past? Yes. yes. And yeah. so this time, 
Tell me why. Tell me why you decided to switch this time. Explain a little bit more on that. I just think he's going to be spending too much time protecting himself, arguing, fighting, and then there's too many problems in this country, and people are just brushing them behind them, and uh, things need to get addressed. So to be clear, those are registered Republicans speaking there. How does he win the general election without voters like those? Well, look, the key thing is a general election. When you're in a primary, uh, Republicans have an opportunity to make a myriad of choices. If you've actually seen through our presidential contest, the Republican Party has a ton of talent, and we're actually not afraid to have our talent on stage. Contrast that with the Democrat Party. They won't even let Dean Phillips appear on the ballot in many states because they're afraid of having Joe Biden actually answer a Democrat within their own party. Respectfully, when though, you if you're not afraid to the general election— Sorry, finish your thought. Well, when you— but, but when you move to the general election, it's going to be a choice between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Who did a better job? And it is without question that Donald Trump did a better job as commander in chief of our country and leader of our government. And so I think that those voters and independent voters and even some, some conservative Democrats are going to compare these two men and realize that Donald Trump not only is more fit to be president of the United States, but he did a significantly better job than Joe Biden has but, sir, done. But the as risk is that the risk, as much as anything, and I've heard, heard this from Republicans, is that some of those those moderate Republicans, some of them never Trumpers, some of those independents who showed up last night just choose not to show up at all this fall. And if you lose a Republican or an independent that you think you would have needed to get, that ends up being as bad as not getting the vote at all. See, actually, I don't think that's going to happen because, again, elections are about choices. They always are. But, sir, 68% like of these they, independents yesterday told the well, AP that the independents, they said that they're not going to vote for Donald Trump. End of story. That's in New Hampshire, a key state. Look, New Hampshire is an important state. Every state's an important state. But we know where the real battle lines are going to be drawn in the presidential cycle. Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia. And if you look at polling, the top two issues in America are the economy and the border. And Joe Biden has been a disaster on both of those fronts. And don't even get started on foreign policy, where the world, frankly, is dealing with some serious geopolitical issues because of the weakness of Joe Biden. That was not not the case when Donald Trump was president. So I think as these campaigns evolve, you give the Trump campaign an opportunity to have its message be heard in a general election environment, and people make that compare and contrast. Now you're dealing with two men who have been president, something that's very rare in American politics. My belief and the, and the campaign's belief is those independent voters and even some of those soft Democrat, conservative Democrat yeah. voters will choose President Trump. We don't need to dive into the economy now, but you know as well as anybody that the Dow and the SCP have now hit record highs after former President Trump during the last campaign said they would plummet beneath Joe Biden. I know inflation remains too high for too many Americans, but I do want to ask you specifically, which version of Donald Trump do you want to see heading into South Carolina and the rest of the election? The Trump we saw after Iowa, who called for unity, or the Trump we saw Monday, who went after Nikki Haley? Well, real quick, uh, the stock market, yes, all-time high, but that doesn't impact working families in this country. It's not impacting poor families in their country. They are looking at the price of food, the price of gas, and Joe Biden. Really important is going to be that Donald Trump shows the voters of our party that he's going to fight for them. Look, primary contests, they get messy. This is par for the course. Happens all the time. But Donald Trump has not taken his eye off the ball, which is making sure that there is an agenda that puts the American people first. That's what he's going to be committed to. That's always going to be the focus of the campaign. These little, the little things that happen between candidates, they happen all the time. Not a big deal, because what the American people truly need is leadership in the White House once again. There is a proposal, as you know, in the Florida House to use taxpayer dollars to help pay Mr. Trump's legal bills. Governor DeSantis, the Republican governor in that state, says he would veto it. What do you think of that proposal? I'm actually not aware of the proposal. Um, I heard something about what the governor was saying, but I haven't studied it, so I'm not going to comment. Listen, Should that's any a public former member of the Florida House. Well, hold on, hold on. Let, me, let, me, let me say this: as a former member of the Florida House, bills get filed all the times, and it's actually irresponsible to comment on them without having had an opportunity to review the legislation. But let me add this: uh, President Trump is under fire from the Department of Justice. This is politically motivated by the Department of Justice, and I will also add Fannie Willis 
Ellis in Georgia. And you could tell how political this is, where Jack Smith and Fannie Willis want a speedy trial. A speedy trial is not for the government. It's actually for the defendant. It's for the defendant if they desire to have a speedy trial. When the government tries to move very quickly because they want to get a conviction, usually it's because the government is up to no good. We've seen that time and time again in our country, and it is without question that the Department of Justice is playing politics of the worst kind. That is very un-American, and that's the type of attitude and actions that destroy our institutions and our republic. Just to be clear, there's no evidence right now that there has been any conversations between the Department of Justice and Joe Biden on this. Obviously, Donald Trump Ooh, was well, indicted see, now, by actually, grand now, jury. This is an important point that you bring up. Cases, you, because cases, this is an know. important point that you bring up now because you have the prosecutor in Atlanta who billed Fannie Willis and actually was meeting with the White House counsel in New in, in D.C. And that so case is going to play out in a courtroom. So there's equal Joe justice Biden, for both sides. If they determine that she's guilty for that, she'll be held responsible. These are important questions that need to be asked. That's all we're saying. But one thing is crystal clear. We've never seen anything like this where the law has been stretched and twisted just to get your political opponent. Congressman Byron Donalds, we appreciate your making time to speak to us. Thank you very much. Anytime. Thank you. Coming up after the break, we have the very latest on the leaked audio scandal shaking up the race for Senate in Arizona and rolling the state's Republican Party. That story is next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We turn now to a dramatic series of developments out of Arizona amid the Republican Party's efforts to flip one of Arizona's Senate seats in November. This afternoon, the state's GOP chair, Jeff DeWitt, announced that he was resigning after a recording from early last year surfaced in which he appeared to offer Republican Senate candidate Carrie Lake money in exchange for her not to run. Is there a number of which? I can be bought. <laughs> That's what it's about. You can take a pause for a couple years. No. And then go right back to what you're doing. Mm -mm. No. 10 million, 20 million, 30, no, no, no. A billion, no. This is not about money. This is about our country. I think it's disturbing that they would even. I am not going to let these people who hate our country tell me not to run. You should call them and tell them to get behind me is it can give you an incredible opportunity to have a bigger voice to fight for stuff than you currently do. Anybody we had this conversation. I'm offended that they um, don't care about our country more. I actually wish you'd just give me a counter offer this big. <laughs> give me a counter. <laughs> I can't. I can't be bought. Come on. I can't. In a statement announcing his resignation, DeWitt accused Lake of leaking the audio for her own political gain while also claiming that he'd effectively been blackmailed by Lake to step down. Lake's campaign says no one from their team threatened or blackmailed DeWitt. You're looking at Vaughn Hilliard right now driving <clears throat> along the campaign trail because he is our NBC News correspondent and today, more importantly, our Arizona native who has spoken to both Carrie Lake and Jeff DeWitt. And Vaughn is on the road with us driving back, what, I think still in Man uh, Manchester as he head back to the New York headquarters of NBC. Vaughn, walk us through this. DeWitt may be accused of attempting to pay off Carrie Lake, but now he's accusing her of blackmail. Pull back the curtain. Right. This is a complicated dynamic here, but you said it. It's in Arizona in a year in which it's crucial not only for that U.S. Senate seat, but also for the presidential election here. In this Arizona GOP chairman, Jeff DeWitt, who used to be the chief financial officer of the Trump campaign back in 2016. He was a Trump appointee during the Trump administration, and he's the current, or I should say as of a couple hours ago, was the chairman of the Arizona GOP. And what you heard play out was Jeff DeWitt attempting to convince Carrie Lake to not run for this U.S. Senate after she lost narrowly by 11,000 votes in that gubernatorial race in 2022. And you hear her repeatedly rejecting 
his offers and suggesting that very powerful people, in his words, uh, could potentially line her up with a job, with a good salary, wanting her to name a number. And I, I think it's worth noting that then in response, Jeff DeWitt announcing his resignation says that uh, he was told that there was additional, at least one additional recording and other stuff that was out there that could be used against him in order to force his hand to leave the party. And just before what the state party is having their major annual event here this weekend, uh, just mere days, 48 hours before, uh, Don, which Donald Trump is attending himself in Phoenix, Arizona this weekend, uh, he is now leaving the party. Now the campaign denies that they ever blackmailed him. But this is a, a really complicated dynamic. And in fact, Peter, I just got off the phone literally about 15 minutes ago with DeWitt here, in which he took, I asked him, what was the purpose of trying to offer her this job and the money? And what was the motive of those behind that effort? And he said it was purely out of political concern that she would lose that U.S. Senate seat in November, particularly with independents, and that she would be unable to win them over, handing the seat either into, into independent Kirsten Sinema or the Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego, who is running for that Senate seat. Uh, Arizona here is a, it's a complicated state, and now this audio recording only suggests that there's further division within Vaughn, this quick party. quick question. Help me better understand this. I was reading up on this. Th this recording took place last year. Why are we only learning about it, hearing it publicly now? That's a very good question, Peter. I uh, have not asked Carrie Lake that here at this point, but this happened sometime nearly a year ago before she announced this U.S. Senate bid. Uh, there is a, a lot of questions at play here, of course, uh, over the course of the last year. DeWitt tells me, tells me that he continued to have a fine relationship with Lake uh, and was taken aback by the timing of the release and the fact that he was privately recorded. And in his statement, he's sounding the alarm, suggesting that if he was being privately recorded, he was openly suggesting uh, and wondering how many other people is she recording, including uh, the former president of the United States yeah. and the likely GOP nominee this go around, Donald Trump, who has often said he talks to Kerry Lake on a frequent basis. Von Hilliard, we wish you a safe ride. Buckle up for a wild ride, not just in Arizona, but everywhere in between the general election in this November and now. Coming up next right here, I'm going to talk to a Republican who knows a thing or two about taking on Trump in the Granite State's primary, New Hampshire's 2016 runner-up. John Kasich joins me next to dig into Nikki Haley's narrow path to the nomination and Mr. Trump's power over the party. You are watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Despite falling short of New Hampshire, Nikki Haley is staying in the race for the White House. She now heads to her home state of South Carolina, where Mr. Trump is already seen as the dominating front runner in that primary. As questions loom about the path forward for Haley's presidential campaign, I want to bring in our panel. Betsy Woodruff Swan, political national reporter and an NBC News contributor. Cornell Belcher, Democratic strategist and an NBC News political analyst. And Sarah Chamberlain, president and CEO of the Republican Main Street Partnership. Sarah, let me get to you right out of the gates. Haley says she's going off to South Carolina. She got third place in Iowa. She said it's a two-person race. Turned out that was prophetic. This time around, she says, hey, the longer this thing goes, the better off we're going to be. Does she have an argument to make here? Is there any way in the world Nikki Haley can do anything? No, she can't win this. I mean, this this is over. This primary is over. I think, unfortunately, she'll lose in South uh, Carolina, and she may end up embarrassing herself, because I think this is this is totally So trust. what does she see as her political future? What is the calculation here? Or does she, she do this for a little bit longer and then pulls out like DeSantis did? I think she does a little longer, pulls out, and maybe gets ready for to run in four years. It'll increase her name ID. I don't know what her full game plan is. Let me ask you about this. Haley, uh, Betsy said uh, that the primary process is not a coronation right now, basically saying we got to stay in this to fight for this thing. But the one thing she did reveal, if nothing else, is that there are a lot of Republicans, moderate Republicans in states like New Hampshire and independents. They weren't all Democrats. Some of these were right down the middle, more in New Hampshire than any other voting bloc, more independents than Republicans or Democrats. She did reveal that that is not a formula for Donald Trump to win states like New Hampshire. You can't win without moderate Republicans and independents. Yeah, and in that sense, it was a wonderful <laughs> night for President Biden because both Haley, mm -hmm. frankly, did not do as well as she needed to do to be treated like a serious contender. And Trump had a really, really rough evening with independent voters, a lot weaker in that space than he should have been compared to Nikki Haley. So from the Biden White House perspective, things, things looked pretty good. 
Obviously, of course, for Trump going forward, that problem with independence is going to be a big issue for him. Um, but it's not going to be a big enough issue, I think, that he has any reason to be particularly concerned whatsoever about this nomination process. Cornell, it's been so striking in the course of the last couple of weeks to, to see all these Republicans who, after January 6th, said, I've had enough, I'm done with this, Lindsey Graham, and you can go down the list, who have now come back around South Carolina. They've effectively all said they will support Donald Trump as he gets ready for the primary there. John Cornyn, among others, now coming out saying they'll support Donald Trump. How surprised are you by how quickly the party has now fallen back in line uh, behind the former president? Did, have, did we see the last two results from the, from the Republican primaries? Right. That that makes me not surprised at all. Right. They know where the core of their of, of the party is and they know that a lot of times it is incumbent. Uh, for better or worse in America, <laughs> you're, you're probably more likely to get knocked off in a primary these days than, than in a general election because so many of our incumbents win, win, win real election. And what, what Trump has shown in this primary process is there is no anti-Trump majority movement within the Republican Party. There just isn't. I, as a lot of our friends would like there to be, but there's not. So they, they are smartly lining up where the votes are that, that can keep them in office. So I'm not at all surprised. I'm actually surprised at how Trump, I guess I shouldn't be, how Trump, Trump went after Sununu and he went after what Reynolds in Iowa, both prominent Republican governors, mm -hmm. in a very sort of angry way in which I was really surprised at that. And I wonder how that all sort of congeals back. Uh, in a couple it, of years. It also shows you the sort of changing impact of governors in a lot of these yes. states. Kim Reynolds, DeSantis, he's gone. John uh, Sununu, Chris Sununu, side by side with, you know, <laughs> right. Haley, she could be gone soon. I want to ask you about the way the Biden campaign should view things right now. We saw what they don't want to call a shakeup, but was still a rejiggering, call it whatever you uh, will. You have two of the key voices inside the White House now going to Wilmington, Delaware. Jen O'Malley Dillon, uh, Mike Donlin going to support the campaign beneath its campaign manager. They are now all focused on November? Do they have the pieces in place to succeed? Well, it, it, full transparency, I, I've, I've, I know Jen, I've been known her for a while. I consider her a friend and as, as, smart, as smart as they come. I'm not surprised that some, that some of the key figures from the White House would eventually go back, go to the campaign and, and, and work there. I think a lot of us on the progressive side have been frustrated that they haven't gone earlier. Uh, because I think a lot of the progressives that I hear talking is the campaign isn't where it needs to be, right? Just to be completely honest, it isn't where it needs to be. It's not running on all, all cylinders. And given the threat that Donald Trump is, shouldn't we be on all cylinders right now while they're in the primary process? That said, I think it's a really good thing that they're moving over. I will say I will put on my NBC analyst cap, take off mm -hmm. my Democrat cap for a second, and say, Caution, though, a little bit on reading too much from primaries into general elections, because primaries are such a narrow swath, a narrow swath of voters actually involved in, in primaries. We can't project them too much onto, onto, uh, onto general elections, although I think the Biden campaign is happy to see that, that Trump is not performing that greatly with independent and moderate voters. Among those, Barack Obama was someone who was calling privately for Joe Biden to make some of these right. changes. I want to ask you something we saw yesterday when Joe Biden was there the first time in this campaign. Betsy, that he was side by side with the vice president and each of their spouses. Um, they were focused on reproductive rights. Giant words said restore Roe over their shoulders. But frankly, for anybody watching, myself included, he was interrupted more than 13 times by protesters there. And it did sort of reveal within the Democratic Party Party, frankly, some of the real challenges that Joe Biden faces right now, certainly among the young uh, voters, among progressives as well. 13 times he was interrupted, just another interruption that took place during his event with the UAW today. Yeah, it's a real uh, sense of, uh, source of softness within his Democratic activist base. Of course, the vice president has worked overtime to try to shore up that wing of the party, the more progressive wing that the president just hasn't always had on lock for much of his career. Uh, but the fact that he can barely do an event that's open to the public without getting heckled or, uh, you know, addressed, shall we say, on this issue, one thing that just highlights is how unpredictable these election cycles can be. Uh, it takes one day of violence followed by a war breaking out that nobody in, in the U.S. would have predicted, certainly not in the U.S. intelligence community, and it dramatically or thus far appears to dramatically be shaking some of the political dynamics in ways people hadn't expected. It's a long time till November, and uh, that's part of the reason that these cycles are always just weirder than you might think. You guys stay at the table. I want to get more of your thoughts. I do want to get right now to our friend, the former governor of Ohio, John Kasich, an NBC News political analyst.
Uh, Governor Kasich, it's nice to see you in 2016. Our audience likely remembers you came in second place to Donald Trump in the New Hampshire primary. I was with you there on your plane to South Carolina and then there with the confetti following in Ohio when you won your home state. Take us inside the reality of what this feels like as a candidate, the reality of the Haley campaign. What are the conversations right now in private? If she wants to keep fighting in South Carolina, what does she tell her donors? What are they saying to her right now? Well, I think, Peter, the, the, the first thing is, do her donors feel as though she did okay? Um, I, I can't judge that. I sort of suspect that they feel that she did fine. I mean, she lost by 11 or 12, but maybe they're saying, you know, and it worked for her that the polls were so in, showing she was going to lose by 20. So maybe they're saying yes. Then when she goes to South Carolina, the question is, can she use the power of what she did, the familiarity that people in South Carolina had with her when she was governor, the things she did that really made them proud. Can she capitalize on that? I think the political establishment is not too keen on her from everything I hear. Um, but I think Donald Trump's got to be a little careful that he doesn't try to go into South Carolina and insult her in some way. There's been, I heard some uh, talk today that his comment about her dress last night did not go over well in South Carolina. People mm -hmm. like that, you know, they could gather around the, you know, the flagpole here and, and give her some support. I think it's still going to be very tough. Um, but I think what she's doing today is she's beginning to talk to her political allies in South Carolina to say, you know, where are we? So it's fundraising. It's your political allies on the ground in South Carolina. And she's got a month to decide this. you got to remember that as well. Yeah, let me ask if I can very quickly. Obviously, we've seen a lot of lawmakers, including in South Carolina, falling in line behind Donald Trump. Are they doing it? Um, Governor Kasich, because they support Donald Trump or because they're afraid of what happens if they don't? What are what do you hear from them in, in your private conversations? <laughs> Peter, come on. You know, that's that's just are they afraid or do they really support them? I mean, I, I look, I I've been told that, uh, you know, that Tim Scott, you know, that he and Trump had some conversations about potential opportunities that you know might have might arise uh, should trump get elected president <laughs> potential opportunities that might that. arise okay do tell <laughs> yeah but i i can't confirm that because i haven't talked to tim scott it's just some you know you get a lot of talk that goes on and i make some calls into south carolina to hear what's being said but um you know it's really kind of curious to me that that he did not support nikki haley she put him in the senate seat but Look, I don't know, and I don't want to be, you know, saying that this is what the truth is, because I really don't know. But it was interesting, curious to me that he did not support Nikki after Nikki, Nikki gave him a chance to be in the United States Senate. Uh, you tell me, uh, Peter. I, I can't I can't really get to the bottom of it, but I hear scuttlebutt. Yeah, unfortunately, in this conversation, I'll be the one asking the question, so I have no good answer to you on that one. Can I ask you very quickly about Ronna McDaniel engaging in all of this? The RNC chairwoman calling on the party to unite around Trump. She said as much even before the election was done last night in New Hampshire. Does she, in your view, have an obligation to stay neutral in this? What, what's your reaction to her weighing in on this race so early? Right, it's Priebus, uh, you know, he got in the middle of it back when I was running, and I didn't think he had any business doing it, and I just don't think that's what it a party chairperson does let it play out and uh, so i don't think it's appropriate that's uh you know i did not like when Priebus did it to me and i'm sure nikki doesn't like that she's doing it to her let it play out governor Kasich, last quick question to you chris sununu supported haley didn't do enough kim reynolds supported desantis was clearly not enough in iowa is the power of these governors has it been diluted in the era of trump <laughs> You know, I think endorsements are greatly over overstated, Peter. I mean, I think there is. Well, you, can you get this endorsement? I'm not sure it moves that much. There are very few, in my opinion, that moves endorsements. Although you have to say that Trump's endorsement has meant some things to people across the country. Yeah. But by and large, I don't think it's it's as critical as many people think it is. All right. Governor John Kasich, it's always a pleasure to see you. I appreciate the seat on your plane and, you. uh, and the conversation. We'll see you along the way. Thanks, Peter. All right, thanks so much. We're back with our panel again really quickly. Sarah, I just want to ask you a little bit about what we heard from Governor Kasich there. Looked like he was sharing some reporting. He hasn't reported out yet, so we won't pounce on the details of the Trump conversations I've privately the same thing, with though. Tim Scott. But it, it doesn't so. seem like it would be unreasonable. Tim Scott no. there standing behind him saying, it's not that I don't like her, it's that I love you right now. The, the, the value of endorsements and, and as importantly, the risk of a third party candidate. How do you view what are the real risks we should be keeping eyes out for for Donald Trump going forward? 
Well, let me first talk about Donald Trump support. There's a lot of Republican Main Street Partnership candidates that are in tough primaries. We're hoping he endorses, like a Mike Boston in Illinois that would um, settle his, his um, primary right down. So there's a lot of times where Trump does help um, his endorsements. Other times, as we saw last cycle, it didn't help, like the United States Senate. Um, so... It, it's interesting how we how we handle all this, but let's go back to um, the fine senator. I've heard the same rumor that could be accurate. He certainly would be a good combination with President Trump on the ticket. Who's the most capable vice president of the names that you see out there if we already look ahead that far? He, he'd be one of my top picks. There's a couple women that would be top picks. Too. They are? Um, I think Sarah Huckabee. Christy Nome, is that good. Christ, good? Christy Nome. Christy Nome helps. Potentially. Carrie Lake, does Carrie Lake help? Or no, hurt? I don't think Carrie. I think Carrie Lake hurts. I think we kind of saw that with the GOP, what they think of her with this unfortunate tape. Uh, I would love to see Carrie Lake on that tape. I bet you would. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Could I ask you about the former, uh, about, about Joe Biden just yesterday, this issue of Roe? Obviously, they really view this as a big deal. The UAW, they view as a big audience, certainly in Michigan, that will resonate with a large working class community. Yep. There are those messages. Should those be the premier messages of the campaign, or is the democracy message the premier message? Well, of the you know, there are. Look, there, campaigns are about storytelling, right? In the end, and as I wrote a op ed for the LA uh, Times this, this morning that sort of talked about this, is don't pay a lot of attention to the polling right now. What you need to pay attention to is what's underneath the polling. And that is who has a good story to tell, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, Bush started off behind, Obama started off behind, Reagan started off behind. But what those incumbents had, they had good stories to tell. They had good stories to tell about them and contrasts and hits on, on their opponents. So all you can really ask for from the beginning is a good story to tell. I think Joe Biden has a good story to tell. Look, I, I worked for Barack Obama in 08 and 12. And going into 12, we had our challenges. I will tell you this right now. I think... I think Joe Biden has a better story to go in going into a re-election right now than Barack Obama did in 2011 going into 2012. The key question is, is he able to tell that story? And that is the key question. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see all and you guys. I, pre I appreciate your patience when we spoke to the governor in the middle of this conversation as well. So to come right here, new strikes and rising tensions on multiple fronts in the Middle East. We're going to get a live report from Tel Aviv right after this short break. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We're following several developments right now in the Middle East amid ongoing negotiations to free more than 130 hostages still being held by Hamas in Gaza. As those negotiations continue, Israel has intensified its operations around Khan Yunus, that is the second largest city in Gaza. It comes as National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby told reporters today that Israeli forces have taken steps to transition to more targeted operations. Meanwhile, the U.S. military has carried out strikes against facilities in western Iraq associated with Iran-linked militias believed to be behind last weekend's attack on a military base in Iraq. The U.S. has also been striking Houthi rebel targets in Yemen in response to attacks on cargo ships and American naval assets in the Red Sea. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins me now from Tel Aviv. Raf, I appreciate your being with us. What more can you tell us about these operations right now in southern Gaza around Khan Yunis? So, Peter, this is some of the most intense fighting we have seen in weeks, and it is happening in the south of Gaza, where hundreds of thousands of Palestinian civilians from the north had fled to seeking shelter. Some 800 of them were inside of a U.N. compound earlier today. They were seeking safety there. The U.N. says that compound was hit by two Israeli tank shells. They say nine people were killed, about 75 more injured. And when their team tried to get inside the compound to give help, they were blocked by Israeli earthworks. Now, we asked the Israeli military about this. They are saying this was not their fire, and they think it's possible that this could have been some sort of Hamas projectile that caused it. That isn't confirmed. There's also grave concern, Peter, internationally about fighting raging around the Nasser Hospital. That is the last major hospital still functioning in southern Gaza. I spoke to the head of the Gaza team for Doctors Without Borders, and he told us a little bit about conditions at that hospital. Take a listen. They are scared of getting out. Uh, they don't know where exactly the tanks are. They just hear shooting, bombing in the, in, the, in the immediate vicinity, and they are terrorized. So it's it's a uh, it's uh, I, I don't have words to describe like how outraging it is that to to, to see that the, the health system is being targeted like this. 
the hospital itself is not being targeted, but all around is being targeted. And now the patients are scared to come. The healthcare workers are scared to come. So then the hospital cannot function. And it's one more hospital that is down. So an absolutely harrowing situation inside that specific hospital amid a healthcare system in Gaza, which has basically collapsed at this point. I asked the Israeli military spokesman when I was in Gaza with him last week whether the Israeli military planned to storm that hospital. He wouldn't rule that out. Peter. Raf Sanchez on the ground with that intensifying fighting around Khan Yunus just a day or so after the Israelis lost uh, as many soldiers as they have in any given one attack since this fighting began. Raf, we appreciate it and thank you for being with us this hour. My friend Kristen Welker is back in the chair tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Erin McLaughlin. She is in today for Hallie Jackson with the very latest news from around the country and around the globe. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.